Hey there, folks. This is Michael with the Reason RX podcast, and my co host is <laughs> Melanie, Minnesota. Melanie. And today we're going to talk again to the award winning teacher, Scott Harris. He's um, like, what's the word? It's tired. I'm forgetting my words now. Use your words, Michael. Use your words. Educator extraordinaire. But he's nice enough kind of to be back with us again today. As I said before, we'll discuss some, you know, a lot of topics with him. Um, there's a lot to discuss in terms of education and teaching. So, folks, today we'll be discussing what education is and what teaching is nature of education, good practices, how to judge it, same thing with teaching. What is teaching? How should it be done? What are best practices? What are mistakes people make? We'll see how much we get done in this episode. Um, and this is important for everyone. It's not just teachers. It's not just students. Parents need to teach their children on their own. Parents need to judge the quality of their education their students their kids are getting so that they can fill in gaps or holes or correct mistakes that are occurring they're in charge and they need to have ultimate oversight over their child don't just punt please do not just punt um, people that work if you're working you're teaching you know, you're a boss. If you want to be a good one, you need to teach your subordinates to do their jobs and do it well. Um, or, you know, people need to learn how to pick a good boss. And part of that is how well the boss can teach them. Because if you're in a job and you just pick the money at first and you don't have a good boss, you're not gaining the skills you'd otherwise be gaining. You're in a job, you pick a good boss, he can, you make a little bit less money, that person can teach you many skills that'll help you alter your career and life if he's good. And then in the long run, your earning potential will be way beyond what it would have been starting with a lot of money and a crappy boss who doesn't teach you anything, is doesn't have integrity, takes advantage of you, puts a bunch of stress in your life. You know, so this is important for you. Um, people are, you know, kind of using principles of teaching and education with each other when they're talking a lot of times. Okay. So we want to dig into that. Um, and then again, to remind you, you know, I remember Melanie, um, homeschool mom, extraordinaire, <laughs> music teacher. Which instruments do you teach, Melody? Piano, flute, saxophone, clarinet, and I started teaching ukulele. <laughs> How to get into the string, the string instruments now. I thought you taught more. Aren't there a few more instruments you're leaving out? I can teach a few of the brass, but they're not my top. Like, mm -hmm. I don't play along very well, but all the other ones I play along really well. Yeah. So I feel qualified now to teach. So, them. yeah, people in Minneapolis, if they want a <laughs> teacher extraordinaire, then they can contact Melanie. Thank you for the shout yeah. out there. <laughs> there were and, recommendations. Of course. And then, remember, folks, um, Michael here, private tutor, math, physics, chemistry, fitness. Um, have some degrees and certifications and all that stuff and students do really well they do my three are just it's so great seeing them develop you know in so many ways even physically because Michael works with them on sort of the physical the workout the move nat um, style and so yeah just a ton of stuff going on with Michael in our life and it's always so great to see them develop and their minds become more acute and yeah. judgmental yeah. <laughs> it's a good work, Michael. Judgmental in a good way, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. In a logical, rational way, being 
benevolent, fair to themselves, fair to other people. Yeah. And so if people Let's out talk there, to our guests. pardon? Let's talk to our guests. Yeah. And so, um, as I say, we'll be talking to Scott Harris today, award-winning teacher. Um, and as people will find, if they're a teacher or parent and they want to work on their teaching skills, thinking skills, um, if Scott has time, he can do some consulting. Um, I can do that also, both Scott and I, or you can hire both of us at the same time. <laughs> Get double bang for your buck. We can do some consulting and thinking skills and logic. Um, you got more time for that in the summer, Scott, or what? I do. Um, I do consulting during the year, um, obviously a lot more time during the summer, but um, year round. Mm -hmm. Good. So as people will find out if they listen to the last episode and listen to this one, um, it's worth it. And he can offer a lot more than a lot of other people out there, unfortunately. So um, last time we're asking you to tell us about yourself and because i flubbed it up it didn't get recorded so yeah would you this like is to my... do that <laughs> tell us about yourself sure. scott please this is my 29th year of teaching i have a degree in history and psychology and i have a master's degree in teacher leadership um, i'm really a philosophy teacher at heart um, I'm currently teaching philosophy, AP macroeconomics, and AP psychology. But I've also taught world history, US history, um, theory of knowledge, which is uh, basically an epistemology course with uh, international baccalaureate. And I coached swimming and water polo for 17 years. Cool. Yeah. Great. Yeah, the people can look up the IB program on the internet to see what that's about. Um, basically, students are in another country and they want to get a high school diploma. Um, so maybe some people from Italy or Switzerland are in the U.S. and they might want to go back home for college, back home to Italy or Switzerland or wherever. And with this uh, diploma, it's recognized internationally. Right. It was started by the Department of Defense to give uh, a quality measure they could then transfer. Uh, and now there's schools all over the world. Um, one of the interesting factors is, uh, unlike advanced placement, the AP courses is, in AP, you can take the subjects that you like or that you're good at. You take AP history or English, maybe skip math. But in IB, you're in all the way. So all your courses are IB. There's a much bigger creativity component, which AP doesn't have as part of the curriculum. And then essays, say for my course, when I taught theory of knowledge, those are sent off and graded and it rotates around the world. Sometimes <coughs> Jakarta, Indonesia, sometimes England. Yeah. And so it's a true international measure. Mm -hmm. The AP curriculum, for those who don't know, is uh, offered at most high schools in America. and it's a college course taught on a high school campus. So you have a college text, a college syllabus, and then the uh, exam is offered at the end of the year. Some schools require it, some it's optional. But if you score high enough, then you get college credit at most universities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've worked with some, of course, AP students, but I've got a number of students who are in the IB program as well. And I know one time I worked with a kid in pre-cal at a private school doing IB and the teacher made the course harder because of some uh, foreign kids in the class. And I'll tell you, I have, in all my years tutoring, all these different public and private schools, I have never, I have never seen some math problems in their homework at the level of difficulty this kid had to do. Yeah. I, but now I wouldn't want to have done that in high school, but I loved it as a tutor because 
yes, a problem I haven't seen before. <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm tutoring. This is great. <laughs> but yeah, like for those kids, it was hard. Just didn't seem fair though. Because you got the normal level of difficulty and it's raised up just for these kids so it doesn't transfer across the different years and different schools as I think it should. But it was fun for me. <laughs> My son Leo, he's 16 and he's applied for PSEO, which is post-secondary education option here at the University of Minnesota. And we'll find out in a couple weeks if he made it in. But that would be all college courses. And it's paid for as if it's just going to high school. I mean, it's just paid for by our tax dollars. So, so hopefully he'll get into that and um, start taking like you know, different things, physics or chemistry there, and different. He's into, interested in drama, and so he needs a place where he can sort of kind of check that out. But I don't want to put him in the high school. I, I, I'm just keeping the homeschool going through the whole the whole way. So that way, yeah. just to give him a little more of a push, and he'll be out too, and you know, meeting people and stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Um, and then you spend a lot of time bicycling, Scott. Yeah. I do. I raced in college and uh, did that for several years after college, but I've been riding ever since. Uh, so that's about 33 years. Cool. Um, and try and do that every weekend for sure and whatever else I can. Good. Mm -hmm. The ph philosopher bicyclist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got your headphones on listening while you're biking or do you do music yes oh yeah absolutely that's when i listen to podcasts so okay. um economics podcasts i listened to y'all's uh what, podcast number two i think <laughs> i listened i was on about a 30 mile ride and so cool listen to that what uh distance a bike race did you do in college most of my races were um, 35 to 45 miles. Hmm. Um, the longest race I ever did was 96. Wow. And that was also in the hill country. So 96 hilly miles are like 120 <laughs> flat miles. Yeah. Where was that at? Where did you do uh, that? In Wimberley, Texas. So that's, um, okay. it's about halfway between uh, San Antonio and Austin. Okay. And that's hilly country there. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Not not mountainous, but lots of short, steep, yeah. up and down. Right. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> and it was on like paved roads, of course. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Nice. It's a lot of hard work. I did one mountain bike race. Only oh. one. Got fourth. Didn't know what I was cool. doing, but I was happy with the result. So yeah. cool. Yeah, that's good stuff. Anything else you'd like to tell folks about your background or interests? Uh, no, that's the basic basic intro. Um, I guess one last thing. I do consulting for um, Free to Choose Media and their sister company, Is It dot org. And those produce economic videos for the classroom. And we're pretty much in every classroom in America, literally. Um, and those are typically 12 to 15 minute videos that show economics in action, telling real stories about real people. Mm -hmm. So they're not technical videos, but they show you uh, how markets work and unintended consequences, things like that. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. And then got a little bio of you that we'll put in the show notes. Did the same thing last time. So good. All right. All right. So on we go. So, so we'll talk about what education is and what teaching is an important topic. Um, so we can judge our own education so we can teach better, help our children, help ourselves. Um, same thing with teaching. Um, it's important to know about so we can teach ourselves, help other people, know if our students and children are being taught well, um, know how to deal with the issue and make up for weaknesses, maybe on someone's part, help them out. 
um, kind of maybe if you have a boss who can't teach very well, maybe you can like be really sneaky and tricky and teach him how to teach. <laughs> But yeah, like I've heard some bosses might be kind of sneaky about that. And even if they know something, they'll try to have their subordinates think of it. And they'll just pretend that their subordinate thought of some idea, even though they already thought of it themselves. And they'll say, oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, we should do that. <laughs> <laughs> but so it's called the engineering of consent <laughs> and and there are teachers that do that that's uh one problem if you have a, a teacher with unchecked bias is they're steering the courses in a certain direction and it's mm -hmm. not okay to dissent from the correct view um, i think that's probably more a problem in university than it is in high school but uh you you do hear stories mm -hmm. And I, I get excited if I discover a kid who sees it different than me, right? The worst thing is a class that agrees with you on everything. Yeah. I mean, obviously some things are, right, the material and it is a certain way, but we're talking about things that are opinion. Um, it's so much more interesting when you do have clashing opinions and they're often afraid to do that because they think, it'll hurt my grade or I'll get in trouble. And I'm like, no, 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 I'll give you extra points <laughs> if we get some disagreement going here because that's when it really gets interesting and you get deep into uh, the subject matters and not just skimming across the top. Here's the bold print terms for the test. Mm -hmm. yeah. Plus, I think it makes students more comfortable being challenged. You know, we get sort of settled in our thoughts and we don't want people giving us making us examine ourselves and what we're thinking so it, it gives students a chance to do that with them too mm -hmm. and they it, they get excited because at first they're very hesitant like is it really safe to do this yeah and then when they find out it's okay and that we get excited when we do this they're like oh well in that case i have a lot of opinions and now we can have some fun yeah yeah, yeah it's important in a lot of areas of life and that's one of the biggest things um, you asked me, why do I teach? There's a line from the, the legendary professor at Columbia, Jacques Barzin. He taught there, I think, 40 years and uh, retired to San Antonio, um, I don't know, late 70s, uh, put out a, a best-selling history book in his, uh, I believe it was his late 80s, called From Dawn to Decadence. Uh, but he said, that one of the goals of education is to put students in possession of their own mind. And I throw that out and kids nod and I'm like, what does that mean? Well, it means to think for yourself. I said, well, what does that mean? That's that throwaway phrase that you've heard your whole life. What does it mean to think for yourself? And it's, it's silent. Like they've never really thought, what does it mean? Yeah. You know, it's just like asking them, what's the value of education? They all have that pre-canned speech of, well, education is important, so you can have a good future. Well, what does that mean? Good and question. That's the, yeah, that's good. the kind, let's define our terms. So, And that's yeah. the kind of thing I like to talk about on the first day of class, when everybody else is handing out a syllabus, and here's the rules. Like, that's your opening paragraph to your novel. That's a chance to get them engaged yeah. and interested. And I, so, I think we waste it on, on rules and paperwork. Yeah. yeah. So what is education then, Mr. Scott? What do you think? <laughs> well, to be put in possession of your own mind presumes a couple of things. First, that you have an understanding of how the human mind works. And you would like to think K through 12, we've taught that. But short of taking a psychology class or having that real um, teacher that you really connected with, we often don't explore how the mind works deductive logic, inductive logic, avoiding uh, fallacies, um, being able to reason through some things yourself, knowing when you don't know, right, so that you can ask for help, uh, being able to ask for help. And so as you develop those skills, then the, the second thing Barzin said 
is that you're building a second self upon which you can rely when times are hard. And so your education is, is almost like a life buoy that when you have these panic moments or you have these hard challenges, you've been through some stuff before and mm -hmm. you've developed some strategies uh, that I'm not gonna, you know, fall down because of this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a good definition I've heard by a Dr. Peacock is to paraphrase, I forget the exact thing, but education is training the conceptual faculty of the young in both form and content, you know, method and ideas in order to prepare them for adult life. So it's got a purpose. It's to right. prepare them for adult life. And the reason for being is metaphysical that the conceptual faculty has to be trained and it involves method and content and not one or the other alone. And that's a great point. Um, it is often easy to just do content, especially if your school is very um, test oriented, standardized <clears throat> testing, even AP testing. Uh, and that's a struggle I have is I think there's a lot of important stuff that's not in the AP curriculum that should be. So I put it in there, such as economic history. That's not covered in macroeconomics very much, but it's very important. Um, so I could be sacrificing, we could be getting lower scores because I'm doing some of this other stuff, but I think the kids are getting a much deeper understanding of the subject, how it really works in the real world. And to me, that's more important than what their score is on the test. Yeah, right. Can I jump to the question on that then, Scott? What sure. measurements, if, there, if we're not testing exactly, how do you know as a teacher and a parent, how do you know if your kids are getting that, if they're really grasping, they're, you know, and reaching their full potential? Let me, like yeah. Getting a good education, you mean? Well, well, that and in your own classroom, like, you know, if you're not yeah, testing, let, how do you know the general so the room? Like, let me answer uh, as a teacher yeah. and then a parent. Um, one, it, do they appear engaged in the classroom? Um, the lack of sleep that teenagers often have, mm -hmm. uh, they're good kids, they're bright, they work hard, but they're over-involved and they're spread way too thin. And if you get them at the wrong time of the day, some of them just really struggle to stay awake, no matter what you do. And you, you joke, I could set myself on fire and you'd still be fighting it. <laughs> Um, so that's a problem, of course, it has to be solved at home. They've got to find a way to, to balance their life better. And, and I built some of those. Uh, well, the, the, and then maybe emailing the parent or talking with the kid. Um, but I build some of those lessons in at the beginning of the year on how do you balance all of that stuff right, yeah. um, so that they kind of have the tools to know how to do it. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, engagement in the classroom. Do they ask questions? Do they feel comfortable asking questions? Um, do they know how to ask questions? Because my psychology class, for instance, is very lecture driven. And I have PowerPoints, but the PowerPoints are the backdrop for the stories we're often telling. And they, they quickly learn that they're designed to be interactive. It's not just me talking but that you can jump in at any time and we, you know, we stop uh, whenever a good conversation sparks up. So then if they're engaged, now when they come home, do they ever talk about the course, right? How's this class? And you can usually get a really quick feel about whether or not they like the teacher and like the class. Yeah. I got an email this morning from a parent telling me how much her daughter loved the class and she's a former AP psych teacher. So, you know, you're always a little nervous, like, are they going to call you out on things you're not doing right? But she said she was learning stuff that, that she didn't know when she taught. Um, and the girl obviously is engaged. She loves to participate. Yeah. That's good. So, yeah, those those dining room conversations is, a, is the best way to take the, the pulse. Yeah. And then, so you say... Um, a teacher can tell by determining whether a student's engaged, right? Did I, you say something, other point that I'm forgetting? The main thing right now is make sure they're Ask engaged. Me. Asking questions. 
Yeah, another thing I do midway through my course is um, I do a, a student evaluation where they get to evaluate me, the course. I don't do it at the end of the semester because um, if there's something we could change and we didn't, you had to suffer through it the whole course. Yeah. Yeah. I, have, I, I don't do it at the beginning of the course because those first couple weeks, I've got pretty big classes, 35, sometimes 42 kids it has to be pretty structured. Mm -hmm. And then as we learn the rules and how to interact in such a large group, then we have room for a little more leeway. But um, I read, uh, so basically the, the evaluation is likes, dislikes, and ideas for improvement. And it's just bullet points. Don't write me essays, just. And so I read them that night, highlight the interesting ones, and the next day I read out both the good and the bad. And uh, it's, because sometimes they think, oh, you're doing this and that's mean, or we shouldn't do that. Oh, well, that's district policy. Oh, mm -hmm. well, they didn't know that. And mm -hmm. now everybody knows it. Um, and yeah, it's funny because you'll occasionally get a kid that's, uh, you know, a little a little rough with you as far as what, but that's, that's to learn from too. And then when you, of course, I don't read their names, but when you read the comment, if the rest of the kids agree, you know it's true. If the rest of the kids gasp, you know well, that kid's maybe a little off in his evaluation. Mm -hmm. But it's really, I've been doing that for, for 29 years, and um, I don't get many that are uncomfortable anymore, but back when I was you know, <laughs> early, I mean, they'll tell, because you think, because their names are on this evaluation, and you think, oh, they won't be honest, Oh, they are. <laughs> they have no problem telling you, but that's also good. That means they're comfortable mm -hmm. and they know that it's not going to affect their grade. Um, but then I can also go talk to that kid because usually the best suggestion uh, will be incredibly vague. And I'm like, ah, but now I can go talk to that kid and ask them what they meant. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And I think another thing, another way a teacher knows that the students are getting it is um, being able to answer in a good developed way um, some essay questions. I don't think multiple choice really do it. Just like Melanie, you can tell when your students can play a piano piece fully through, it's good, but then you know they understand it more when they can play it with feeling. And oh, so for that, sure. That's yeah. kind of like a musical essay. They're not, what's note A? Ding! <laughs> what's this? Da, da, da. Mm -hmm. They got to play the whole connected thing, just like write a whole essay. When, and that integration is important. That's, you know, standardized tests, as much as we say sh school shouldn't be driven uh, by them, they're not nothing either. Mm -hmm. Right. In, in order for us to have these interesting and rich conversations, you have to understand the terminology and, and some of the the infrastructure of the content in order to have those conversations. Mm -hmm. So the first third of the PowerPoint is never as exciting as it gets later on when we now, uh, for instance, we just finished uh, chapter nine is um, psychological measurement and intelligence. So what is IQ? What is intelligence? What does it mean to be smart? Well, we need to talk about IQ test and are they valid? Are they reliable? And, and once we get through that, we can then talk about different theories of intelligence and have some of these broader conversations about the SAT and is it a valid measure, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then uh, you got to know, just like Mozart had to memorize basics of music and get notes down how to know do you, to do particular individual things and then put them together he had to master his tools before he could be very very creative um, same yes. thing with like grammar you have to memorize some basic facts and some of that could be appropriate for to have like a multiple choice test on but um, you got to get your grammar down to communicate well, and then once you get it down, 
you can for emphasis for humor for um, making people look at things in a different way you can start kind of bending the rules so to speak <laughs> if you're following the rules you do something different then you follow mm -hmm. the rules afterward but mm -hmm. the breaking the rule in the middle only makes sense because of what you're doing around it and mm -hmm. because you've learned how to communicate mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah so in in chapter nine we cover creativity and what is it and how do you measure it? And so some of the, the good work that's been done on that is by Dr. Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. Uh, his, his name has about 13 letters and uh, I think he's Hungarian. Um, but he defines creativity as taking the given symbols of a domain and rearranging them in a way that is accepted by the field for inclusion. So as you pointed out, Mozart had to master the basic know-how of how to do these instruments. Once that's mastered, it's then how do you rearrange it? How do you improve it? Same with an artist, right? Picasso painted blue people and faces on the side of their head. Yeah, it's not my favorite art either, but you know, and kids say, well, I could have done that. First of all, no, you probably couldn't have, but, but secondly, you didn't. And he <laughs> did, and it took art in a new direction just like Andy Warhol doing everyday objects as art, broke, not my favorite either, but he's important because he, he helped break that barrier of high art versus low art. And that and now we look at comic books as art, right? Whereas it used just to just be literature and paintings and so on. And the field accepted it. And so the kids ask, well, what about, you know, the struggling artist who says they're misunderstood? I was like, they may be misunderstood. They may also be not that great, mm -hmm. right? Because have you really mastered the tools yet? Mm -hmm. Mastery takes a long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I think on that note about, the, so to speak, about the composers, you know, noted composers, the ones who really stand out in history are those who really knew their genre well but pushed it, they pushed that envelope and really in a sense got the next sort of genre started. I mean, there's just many, you know, all the way back to Bach and then Haydn and Mozart and Beethoven and take it all the way up to Rachmaninoff and then of course the contemporaries today. But I mean, everyone had their place where they took what everyone knew and were comfortable with form and pushed it and it, just opened up all new opportunities amazing right and 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 people weren't necessarily comfortable with it then because it was yeah. changing the known mm -hmm. um you see that i don't listen to country music uh but you see that over the past decade or two about what is country music and is it old school george Strait or is taylor swift country or she really pop and now you have this rapper i don't know his name but he's done a song and they they literally didn't know whether to classify it as rap or country, hmm. but it's now a best-selling song and he's changed the domain. And then people can, interesting point here, they can see the kind of relevance of this, but what's going on right there with the country music thing Scott brought up, that's definition. We've talked about the importance of definitions in the previous episode. We've talked about it before. We'll talk about it in the future. But there's an example. Definition isn't some little ivory tower woohoo thing. And I think it's people get a bad mistake of it because of philosophy. So we get another issue that comes up here. A lot of times in English, instead of really learning how to form a concept, we got this great opportunity to get a concept and really define it. And if you're really going to get the concept, you got to have examples, reduce it back to the evidence of the senses, connect it with other things, really know what it means. And you got this great opportunity and it's just blown. Instead of that, what do we do in school? Here's a word write down a little word chain next to it and memorize it and then do it again it's horrible that should not happen okay for some maybe we cannot 
get a definition or fully develop in school every single concept. It'd be mind blowing. But some of it should be done. Because, I mean, when I was in school, I thought a lot of stuff was stupid. You got some big word like, I don't know, so-called big word like futile. And someone might say, that means useless. Well, then why do we have the word futile if it just means useless? Because it doesn't. There's more to it. Or coercion. Or like... Um, you got anger versus fury. You know, fury, that means being angry. No, there's it's a lot more, more to it. Right. Yeah. Make sense? Yeah. I, uh, I always laugh when people use the word utilize. Just <laughs> say, to say use. Right? Right. You're, you're not, you know, I'm a fan of George Orwell and, and Mark Twain, both of whom said if you can... Uh, you know, never use a $10 word where a $5 word will work, yeah. mm -hmm. right? But but you do need those $10 words occasionally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and one mistake I think that kids, and I don't think it's intentional, is they're taught in English to use that vocabulary and all those vocabulary words that they, um, that they had to, to memorize, but they use them all at once, all on <laughs> one page. And you have these sentences that are multisyllabic and it's just overly flowery and it's horrible writing yeah so some kids don't know enough of that stuff but then the top end kids you often have to teach them to prune their paragraphs yeah unfortunately um in my experience you've got like valedictorians trying to use big words and they have no idea what they mean that's how <laughs> you can pick out a valedictorian <laughs> well, I, and you know, they uh, some of them do know what that stuff means, but they've been trained that that's good writing because they get A pluses every time they write yeah. that way. And it, and then nobody writes that way in the real world. So mm -hmm. why are we training them? Yeah, um, it's 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 too much. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's harder to learn that when you're out in the real world than say in school, which is a great place to learn that because that's not in the job, not when you get right. a a, a job with a newspaper or some kind of column or you're doing a blog for a um, for your living you know that's not the place to learn it. yeah learn it in school so you don't have to suffer learn how to write well in school so you don't got to suffer in real life yeah. right and, and that's part of them developing their style is that if I notice you're writing over what you said it's something standing out either you know bad grammar or the fact that mm -hmm. you've got all of these really complex words. And by that, writing over what you said, you mean the language is more complex than it needs to be to express the thought, or it's right. like beyond what you know the student is really, beyond the level of abstraction, you know the student is really capable of being at home on. Yeah, and when they write that way, again, they're used to getting praised for being so smart. I say, um, well, you know, there's a lot going on here. I said, tell it to me like I'm six. Pretend I'm a six-year-old. And they go, oh, and then they say it in plain English. I said, now go write that. <laughs> yeah. And but and you should see the look on their face because they're like, but then I don't get to use, you know, again, <laughs> use use the tools that are necessary for the job. Yeah. And, and, you know, don't fire all your guns at once using every big word, you know, every complex. Yeah. Um, and then there again, we get to, you know, as we talked about the importance of definition, the importance of philosophy comes up there. But we get to, in discussing what we just did, we see some more ways to evaluate a good education, like can the person give examples of the concept? Like, are they just using a word? So right. give me an example. Tell me where an experience the word comes from. Like, can you start out and think about what you were like as a baby and how you developed that idea? You know, not psychologically, but cognitively. Can you do it or not? If you can explain the stuff you learn from when you were young, trees, 
mom, dad, restaurant, waiter, friends, group, school, society, whatever, and build up to this concept, the level of abstraction, not like entirely 100% precision, because you, you know, it depends what you do for a living, but if you can at least sketch it out, what you'd have to go through to get to that concept, then that's another thing you, people should use to see if you're getting a good education. Can you give examples? Can you trace where, from where that comes in reality? Can you relate the concept to other things important in life? That's a, a good example of that in my economics class. We do an essay on uh, James Buchanan won the Nobel Prize in 1986 for public choice theory. And this is the idea that um, he calls it politics without romance, that we don't glamorize politicians like Mr. Smith going to Washington to do the good work of people of District 21, but that politicians are real people who respond to incentives and are flawed just like the rest of us. So he has this idea called the uh, the cost-bound conception of choice, which basically says that any time the cost of a decision gets separated from the person making it, you're going to have some unintended consequences, mm -hmm. and they're usually going to be bad. So, of course, we examples of politicians, they vote for a bill or something, and they, you know, they're never really accountable for the outcome. So I give them an essay in which, after we've been over many examples, I give an example of extra credit. Usually students come to the teacher saying, can I have extra credit, by which they mean they want a preformed assignment by me. Well, that's more work for me. Like, who needs extra credit here? You create the assignment. And they're like, well, what do I do? And I'm like, well, create some value for me, right? Because they want to read an article, highlight it, and go here. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well, that's worth two points. I hope you enjoyed <laughs> reading it. That didn't do anything for me. So instead, I had a kid make um, make a graph showing the different schools of thought, Keynesian, neo-Keynesian, classical, who the key thinker was, what the big idea is. That's a handout I can use next semester. <laughs> so he thought about what were my needs. He created value for me. <laughs> so that there's your example, right, that when the work is tied to the person creating the points, you get points. So they then have to come up with an example of either school politics or their personal life where the decision, the consequences of the decision got separated from the person that made it and the bad outcome. So now they've got to integrate that and think through their life of when did that happen? And of course, it's not hard to come up with examples, mm -hmm. uh, whether from child rearing or what have you. Yeah. And then this is important stuff, again, not merely an academic issue, because if we stop and think, in life, we have doctors, scientists, or people who are called doctors, people who are called scientists, people who are called engineers, people who you get your food from. Okay, when you go to a doctor, do you want someone who's merely memorized stuff? or? who was formed concepts as we're talking about, like cancer, diabetes, um, or what some drug does. Do you want some doctor who can give you examples of cancer, know where the concept comes from, integrates it with something else, knows the real cause, or do you want something, some, a doctor who, oh, this is what everyone says cancer is, I don't know, and they don't say explicitly, I don't know, but that's their MO, their method of operation. I don't know, I don't care, I'm busy. That's what everyone <laughs> says, CYA, this is what we're gonna do. Again, a lot of that wouldn't be explicit in the person, but it kind of come up in their thinking. Um, they just memorize a bunch of stuff because that's what you do in school. That's what you do with definitions. That's how science works. Do you ever prove Newton's laws or do you just, Memorize this stuff. So, you know, you should, we should want someone who in health, in medicine, in engineering, 
and marketing really digs into the concepts. Otherwise, like in marketing, you can be wasting millions of dollars. Well, that's a good example. I've read some studies on doctors and, and good doctors already do this. But when you ask them, what should I do? Uh, the better thing to say is, what would you do if this were you? Right. Because it gets them to reframe it in their mind. And so now we're, we're back to cost bound conception of choice or the easier way to say it is skin in the game. Mm -hmm. Right. And now kids get this idea of skin in the game changes how people make decisions. Uh, and now they've integrated that concept. So we go to maybe U.S. history class and we look at who had the franchise, who had the right to vote. And uh, blacks, of course, didn't. Women didn't, although in New Jersey they did. Hmm. All right. Some places. Um, and then we read about property owners and how many states you had to have to own property in order to vote. And you ask them why that is. And of course they've taught well, it's because the rich are trying to maintain their power and so on. And you can make that argument, but also it's skin in the game. That if you own property, you view what happens a little bit differently than somebody that's maybe just moving through. And now they start realizing, well, there's more to it than just the oppression narrative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not that, in some cases, the oppression isn't there, and we should get rid of it. It's just there's this other factor we should consider. Well, and so we're talking now about lowering the voting age to 16. Um, what skin in the game does a 16-year-old have? At least 18-year-olds are probably paying some taxes, mm -hmm. maybe with a summer job. But heck, why not 14 if we're going in that direction? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then we got to think about not just like skin in the game, but the nature of the entity involved. Um, how much is a 16 year old capable of knowing about politics and the big picture? Um, what kind of thought processes can they engage in? You know, we got to integrate psychology, um, kind of thinking skills in here. We shouldn't just look at the 16 year old alone, voting 16 year old, integrate, integrate, integrate. I'd raise it before I'd lower it, <laughs> yeah. right? I mean, no. <laughs> here we're, we're raising the age of smoking and vaping to 21 in many states because the frontal lobe's not fully formed until the mid twenties. Fine, you're gonna let them vote. Mm -hmm. Like if we're going to make the frontal lobe argument, then it should go all the way across. Because we got to remember, as we talked about last time, voting is putting politicians into power and they are in charge of laws and therefore force. So the question should be when we integrate it and we think about it, what people do we want to put in charge of those who are going to be in charge of force? As we said last time, when you're making a law, you should think about, are you willing to kill someone about this? Because eventually it can happen in enforcement, not necessarily on purpose, but on accident, when someone is restrained forcibly by the police, a death can happen. And if, well, go ahead. the homeschool mom, I think it was in California, who got put in jail. Because I think she was homeschooled or didn't have her kid in the school that the state said she had to go to. Maybe she fudged her address and they put her in jail. And they just asked a, I won't say who, but a certain senator. And uh, she said, well, um, that's an unintended consequence. And to your point, Michael, no, it's not. That's at the end of every law mm -hmm. is men and women with guns who come to put you in an iron cage because you thought your kid would be better off being educated somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And I'm not willing to lock up my fellow citizens for making that decision. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so we got to think about that in terms of 16 year old. So there's a good example of, and if we had more time, we could dig in there even more than we did about definition, um, forming concepts, um, the philosophy involved um, and the, the politics.
Well, and, and when this came out, 16-year-olds across the country took to Twitter um, citing stupid things that they had done. <laughs> like they were aware enough that they shouldn't be voting hmm. uh, to, to make these jokes about themselves. And I love my 16-year-old students, but they're very optimistic, right? They need to be more jaded. Mm -hmm. And that happens after about 15 years of seeing politicians lie to you and break promises and the deficit continuing to go up. And after a while, you just realize mm -hmm. it, it, it laws aren't the solution to everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, that's a good example there. Um, so parents, students, teachers, um, bosses, employees, everybody, remember, it's good to think about um, definition um, and concept formation. Um, as we say, some things about it, you know, you should try to, for concepts that are important, make sure you have examples of it and then be able to define it in terms of those examples and then know where the concept comes from. Just like, quick example, um, friendship or friend. Where does friend come from? So we're thinking about, okay, we're young, we're, we're developing. We first learn to see and move around. We learn we got this world around us. We learn about mom and dad, learn a little bit about food, then maybe some um, dogs, cats, get grass and trees and you get the concept of plant or implicit concept, um, animal, see birds, um, you, you know, your parents are playing with you. Then you'll learn that there are other people. Um, some people you like to play with um, and you call them like a uh, friend. Then you'll learn that, oh, this person hits me. Even though we can play, this person causes pain. I don't really like this. There's something more than just being able to play with each other. Um, then you develop more through, you know, what you learn in elementary school and junior high school about the backstabbing and the group kind of politics among kids. You learn more in high school. Um, and the older you get, the more you, the more characteristics of a friend you find in the deeper you can develop the concept into eventually kind of like we were talking about last time some Scott um, how yeah a friend is someone basically you share values with and enjoy spending time with um, so there was just a quick run through on sketching out that concept and we can use that as uh, one example then get others and then use that for understanding and developing concepts in other areas. And, and a friend is someone who makes you a better version of yourself. Mm -hmm. That you like who you are more when you're around them. And I said, now we all have had those friends in the past that maybe made us a worse version of ourselves. You, you see the knowing nods out <laughs> in the classroom. Yeah. Like they intuitively get that abstract concept that friends should improve you, strengthen you, help you further your goals, that other guy is just going to get you in trouble. Yeah. And that's where people are starting to connect the concept of friend more to morality and politics and get it, be, you know, in politics in a sense, but it becomes more abstract when the morality really enters into it explicitly than when you're younger and it's just play. And that's, um, Oh, I've got a whole bunch on friendship from Aristotle to the, the Stoics. And we mentioned this last time, can you be friends with someone who's dead, right? Jacques, mm -hmm. Jacques Barzin has now died. He died a, um, about two years ago at 102, 103 years old. I'm friends with that guy. I've read so many of his books. I, we just connect on so many levels um, versus, say, a utilitarian friendship in which we're friends because... I'm tutoring you in psychology and you're tutoring me in math. And when the semester ends, we don't talk anymore. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's a friendship. Yeah, it depends but, how you uh, define your terms. Like in Germany, yeah. they call that, they differentiate friend from acquaintance. 
Yeah, that's yeah. that's the term I use. Yeah, same here. Um, it's a good term. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Serves a useful purpose. Well, and I think if your class, if the, if the students in your class are understanding the concept of friendship and what makes a friend versus just an acquaintance or someone who doesn't bring out the best in you, these are great tools to start thinking about spending who you want to spend your life with. You know, sure. They, I mean, friends should be important enough. What about someone you're going to be with for the rest of I mean, it's really something. I end uh, my psychology course with a love lecture, full period, and then a two-day beauty lecture. Because <laughs> Plato said we should end all education with the contemplation of beauty. So <laughs> we do that. But I build exactly on that. I say, you know, raise your hand if you had that friend who uh, often it was in middle school, who your parents said was no good for you. And you're like, you don't know him like I do, mom. He's cool, <laughs> yeah. you know. And then six weeks later, and of course, all their hands go up. <laughs> and then when we get to romance, we talk about sometimes why are girls attracted to bad boys? And again, it's the, I know he broke all those other hearts, but look how good <laughs> he's being for me. That's your ego talking. Yeah. You know, and your girlfriends know he's no good for you. And it's just a matter of time till you're crying and being consoled. Mm -hmm. Or vice versa. Boys going after the wrong girl. Yeah, could be. Yeah. Um, That'll never happen. <laughs> <laughs> or, of course, folks, nowadays, yeah, some boys after boys or girls after girls. <laughs> yeah. But it's back to, then, what does a good romantic partner do for you? Just like friendship. Do they make you a better version of yourself? Are mm -hmm. they constantly trying to change you? Yeah. Um, it, you should pretty much like people as they are because core components of human personality don't change much. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, so Scott, when you're t having these sort of, you know, really good conversations, how much do you ask them to sort of introspect about themselves? I mean, it's, it's comfortable to talk about, you know, what are your friends like? Are they good for you or potential spouses? But what about that? How well do you know yourself so that you know what to value in another person? Do you get into that much? I mean, is that a um, well, the the love lecture is is pretty tightly scripted because we fit a lot in well, it. Um, but it, it it has a trigger warning at the beginning, and it says, uh, warning, this lecture breaks up one to two couples per semester. <laughs> because of what you just said, that they're taking what they learn, and we actually get an operational definition of love. Mm -hmm. I tell them, you will be able to measure, is somebody loving me, or are they not loving me? Yeah, right. Saying that they are. And once they integrate that, then they can see who their friends are. Is oh. it's usually the boyfriend who gets cashed in. Wow, that's very insightful. That, that yeah. that's amazing. That's great. What level class is this? Is this seniors or is this? That is a junior senior mix. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So they're 16, 17, 18. Right. And then with some of that, what you were saying again, it's like. Another aspect of integration with the friendship thing you were talking about, um, and Melanie brought up originally, besides integrating the concept of friendship with morality, um, I mean, when you're in elementary school, did you ever think about how a friend would help you develop cognitively or logically or anything? Yeah. I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> sure, sure. And then when we're older, you know, I think it's easier to see connecting friendship to morality, like the honesty and some things like that. But on a higher level, in a broader concept of morality, what is the good? What is good for us? And this is philosophical issues. So if people think, how is philosophy stupid? How is it relevant? <laughs> As oh, we talked about, what so is the relevant. good? Yeah. What is it to right. be a human being? What is the good life? What is knowledge? When do I know something? What is art? What is the beautiful in the sense of generally, not just as people might think like, oh, she's a beautiful girl in a magazine. No, beautiful in general. But that is philosophy. And so we're integrating friendship with concepts of philosophy when we develop the concept of friendship more. There's more integration to other areas of thought. 
And and one uh, girl, a volleyball player, wrote me a note at the end of the year saying that that kind of reflection and integration changed her taste in men. Cool. That she used to be attracted yeah. basically to eye candy, you know, the attractive athlete or whatever. But now she was looking for somebody who could engage her intellectually. Mm-hmm. That's great. Where she had never really thought about that much before. Yeah. Cool. And that's a huge leap. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then getting uh, integration of both of those, like I heard um, Leonardo da Vinci was supposed to have been great mind, supposed to have been physically perfect. All the ladies liked him. Stuff like that. <laughs> it's what I've read. But, uh, so we've developed some concepts really well, just as an example, like, uh, friendship, but remember the idea is knowing how to form concepts and how to judge whether your students, your children, you yourself know a concept. So if we're going to teach, we should sit down and think about a concept, know examples of it, know where it comes from, what it relates to in other areas of life, as I said with the friendship thing. Um, We should think about that before we go into a classroom. Then you're going to be a more effective teacher. Then like when you got the integration thing going on, for example, I use that. So with math, I can teach someone math, but because I know how some of the math or science come up in engineering, aerospace, chemistry, finance, exercise, nutrition, I can meet a lot of people's interests. And I think digging into a lot of interests Preferably having a lot of interests is an important aspect of a good teacher. Because someone's going to come to you. You don't know who it's going to be. They have their interests. It's not your job to impose interests on them. It's your job to prepare them for adult life and to help them develop their own interests. And so if you have a broad variety, you can target it to them or show them things they never even would have thought about. And maybe that totally changes the um, trajectory of their life, you know? And that's what you'll hear students say about good teachers. Um, Often it's math or, you know, it's a subject that the kid didn't like, history. And they'll say that 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 teacher taught them how to love that subject. Mm Probably they're not going to take a bunch more courses, but they saw what was lovable about that subject because the teacher had the passion for it. And then, you know, hopefully they're starting to make connections with other subjects as they really start to get interested in learning. They're making these interdisciplinary connections. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, in teaching music, I I really, really like teaching music theory. It's just, I just love it. And I think the kids do pick up on the passion I have for it because we almost start every lesson with it just about every time. It's a great chance to sort of get the mind thinking and a little bit more critically looking at the nuts and bolts a little bit more. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I could see just in any class, if you're kind of breaking it down into the essentials and starting from there, maybe on a regular basis, that would help the kids kind of, you know, get in there with you and then really start to grow from that. I would hope that, do you find that's the case with you, Scott? Absolutely, and I like what she said, that you you do it pretty much every time, because I think we talked about the curse of knowledge last time. When you know something really well, it's it's um, you have this expectation that people pick it up when you explain it once or twice. <laughs> and that's not the case when you're new to a subject. You need lots of repetition. So by you demonstrating every little day, here's a little bit of music theory, that's when they're going to integrate it enough to they start seeing the examples in the real world and coming up with mm-hmm. you know and then play in the, in the songs they're playing it's very easy to pinpoint certain theoretical ex- expressions and examples and then it's relevant it's not just here's this book okay now we'll set that aside now we'll play music i mean 
there's a reason we're studying this, and it's great. It's, it is pretty fulfilling. I'm sure you must see that when you kind of bring it all full circle. Yeah, yeah I, um, I just showed them the scene from the movie Amadeus where Mozart hears the piece that Salieri wrote for the king <laughs> and goes to play it. And the king says, from one hearing only? He yeah. says, I think I have it. <laughs> and then, of course, he jazzes it up yeah. and makes it better. And so now we're back to Mihai's definition of creativity. He took the symbols of the given domain, rearranged them in a way that was more interesting, more pleasing. It's the very definition of creativity. Well, and that scene is so, it just shows Mozart how innocently he it wants, in his mind, he needs to make it better. He doesn't care about that person's feelings. As a matter of fact, yeah. he's like, that doesn't quite work, does he it? He said, yeah, it really doesn't work, does it? <laughs> you try, and then he's off and running. And it is yeah. just delightful to see someone just throw all that to the side and just get into the beauty of the music. I don't know if it's right to say he doesn't care about the other person's feelings. It seems more like he's so passionate about music and so benevolent. He's thinking the other person's on the same assumption. So he's thinking how can I do this? Change it and make it better. It's so implicit and unquestioned in his mind. And he probably kind of projects and assumes that other people are that way too. And the other guy is going to be all over it. Like, oh, that's great. Yes, that's such a good idea. I wish I would have thought of that. Oh, look, we can do this too. Exactly. You know, I think, yeah. Do you think he'd, well, be that, more, he'd be more like that? He, he certainly loved the music. And that's, you know, there's that old line about be hard on ideas and soft on people. He was all about making the music better. And if you really care about excellence, you shouldn't be caring about whose feelings got hurt. Um, there are some groups that claim Mozart was on the autism spectrum, but hmm. the problem with that is adv advocacy groups are always trying to latch famous people onto their causes. Um, most of what I've read in psychology think probably he wasn't. And I did take a course in Mozart um, and, and the professor talked about how the movie over amplified his childlike characteristics a little bit. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. I guess I wasn't trying to imply that he just didn't care about people or their feelings, but he cared so much about the music that it never got in the way of him yeah. fully, I guess, getting into the music that was in front of him. So, yeah. Yeah. I see what you mean now. Yeah, it's just, you know, I make that point because i think that's uh nowadays something we always have to consider people maybe misunderstanding got to make sure we understand objectively what you're saying engage in good communication make sense yeah for sure yeah. But, all right so um <laughs> we'll have to make this education part one what is education <laughs> part one <laughs> It's getting after nine o'clock, at least getting close to, it's like my bedtime or thereabouts. Um, Melanie has not yet trained herself to go to bed on time yet. She stays up too late. <laughs> she define needs to work your on terms, that. Michael, define, <laughs> define yeah. your terms. What's too late? What's not? You'll learn that when we have some people on who discuss circadian <laughs> rhythms and sleep. I've already thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> I know you have. It's I like, know. man, Melanie's not reading these books I recommended or listening on Audible. <laughs> we'll just have to have a podcast guest. Or I have, and I have three kids in a business, and I don't go to bed at nine. Yes. <laughs> that doesn't work here. I've got stuff to do. Health is health. You have to take care of yourself, too. I if you know. die, you're not going to be around to take care of your kids. And how's that going to be, Melanie? Exactly. I'm not going to die from it. I'm not going to die. <laughs> I guess that's another talk. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Take care of yourself. But Jeez. Nice to have people care about me. But like I say, if you're not going to discipline yourself, then other people have to do it for you. <laughs> <laughs> Great to talk with you, Scott. Oh my gosh, it was just so enlightening and refreshing and well, loved it. It's just good. I enjoyed it. Yeah, so we didn't get to talk about what is teaching today. We got into it a little bit by implication, but mainly talk some about what is education. A lot more we could say, but 
because there's the different aspects about preparing the child for adult life, what things they need to learn to prepare for adult life. We could discuss that more. The method and content thing we're talking about, what methods, what content, but hopefully it was clear in what we were saying that the methods that they need to learn are logical methods. Um, and then we could get into more particular things about uh, mathematical methods, historical thinking, philosophic thinking. We got into some philosophic thinking, the imports of it, um, aesthetic methods. So those are some others. Logic in general, but then those others in particular, biological thinking is very important. But certain methods and content we need to learn in school as Melanie was saying, we should learn how to write in school in a controlled environment so we don't suffer all the bad consequences that we will when we get older. Like a good example I have about that, I was reading a book by, I think I could remember the book wrong, but I think I read this in a book by Robin Olds called Fighter Pilot, I think it is. He was, uh, became a Brigadier General in the Air Force. Um, I think he was in Vietnam and Korea. Um, and I think it was in this book, he said that the number one thing, number one, that keeps people from being promoted is having a superior who cannot write. Because if you think about it, you have a superior who cannot write, the superior He's writing to his superiors who don't even know the subordinate to try to get him a promotion. So these people, all they have is a letter. If the writing is bad, he's going to throw it out. So if we stop and think the um, superior or the subordinate, he needs to be able to identify for the people deciding on the promotion. He needs to identify for them specific concrete examples of what the person did. He needs to identify right. specific concrete examples of what makes that person qualified for the higher position. And he needs to have the abstractions in there to connect it all. Teacher recommendation letters. Yeah. Um, most schools I've been at have a seminar occasionally on how to do it. And they've used my letters sometimes nice. uh, as examples because too often it's this is one of the best students I've ever had. Well, colleges <laughs> hear that all, you know, or they talk about their GPA. My job is to tell them nothing about your resume. That's what your resume is for. Mm -hmm. My job is to tell them about your character, about what's unique about you in the classroom. Uh, how you're engaged in learning, that's stuff they can't see on your paper transcript. And I just wrote one for a kid who's trying to go to MIT. He's got two uh, studies published already, <laughs> as one does in high school. <laughs> and uh, he said, you know, that the letter doesn't talk about my grades. And I said, that's what your transcript is for. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell them this other stuff. Cool. Nice. But... Um... So what we did talk about, yeah, in terms of um, education, the writing, and there were some examples there about Robin Olds and what Scott just said, importance of doing it in high school so you don't suffer in college and the importance of being able to write. Look what Scott can do. Look what some superiors in the uh, military can do. Um, and think about yourself, you know, who's going to be better at marketing um, someone who can write well or someone who can't, who's going to be better at communicating with his patients, like a doctor who knows some grammar and has spent time formulating his thoughts on paper, or someone who is kind of inarticulate and doesn't organize his thoughts, you know? And how is that going to affect you? So, education serious stuff. It's not just grades, college, the more important thing is we say 
it comes up in everything we're saying here and in past podcasts and in future podcasts is getting the student ready for adult life. As we've talked about with Danny Clark in movement, uh, it's the whole child doing what you need to do for the child to make them a good human being and a good thinker and get them ready for adult life. Um, so what do y'all, um, what am I forgetting that we've discussed in the podcast in regard to education? I think he summed it up pretty well. Cool. I was thinking I was pretty tired and I forgot it, but I'm glad I'm like, at least half my brain's working enough to be able to summarize well. So cool. But a lot more to discuss on education. So we'll try to do that in the next uh, podcast. Discuss more of these aspects of education, what it really is, get into some good characteristics of teaching. So any last words, Melanie? No, just thanks again, Scott. Yeah. Really great. I enjoyed it. Started. Thanks for having me. Yep, you're welcome. All right. Have a so yeah, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Melody. No, I just, I have a good remainder of the school year. And... Yeah. Thank we'll, you. We'll hopefully be talking to him before it's over. Sounds good. All right. Thanks, so Scott. thanks, folks. Thanks for listening. Hope this was beneficial. I remember good for everybody, student, teacher, parent, um, any professional. Um, hopefully you learned some things about education and thinking and logic. Um, if you have any questions, just let us know. Thanks for listening, and we will talk to you all soon.